All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. Here we are, Thursday, January 16th, and there's not a lot to get excited about in the U.S. dollar. Um, after we did get a nice little bump last week, right in there, seeing prices push right towards that 97.70 level of resistance, it couldn't quite make it. We got that topping kind of innuendo that we looked at on Tuesday. Uh, prices did put in a, a, a small short side push only for support to show up that same zone that we've been looking at, 97.05 up to around 97.17, 97.20. Of uh, specific interest was that prior swing high that came in right around 97.09. That's what helped to mark today's low. Uh, it seems as though the dollar is getting a bit of a push on this morning's retail sales print. And you know, maybe just a facet of sellers not being ready or able to take control of this thing on a longer term basis. Um, so with that, many of these US dollar pairs are going to be in a similar light and a similar backdrop where we're largely looking at either waiting for a bigger picture setup, a bigger picture trend to avail itself, or we have the alternative option of playing in between the cracks, i.e. looking for shorter term swings off near term support and resistance levels. Um, you know, perhaps even with an eye towards those big picture, longer term breaks, but at this point, we're likely going to need to adapt to the environment, which has been a bit more quiet of recent. Now, there are a couple of news items on the headline for next week, uh, specifically out of Canada. Uh, there's Canadian inflation, Bank of Canada uh, rate decision next Wednesday. I think that could prove to be pretty exciting, especially in a dollar CAD pair that has remained somewhat on the move of recent. But for this webinar, I want to look at a series of U.S. dollar pairs. I have a couple of additional markets that I wanted to take a look into. As usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So setups you have or pairs you want to take a look at, feel free to fire those my way. I'll do my absolute best to answer or to help with as many as I might be able to. Okay, so on a longer term basis, I am still harboring a bearish USD bias, very similar to what I had written in the Q1 technical forecast on the currency. Uh, it, this does sink in with last year's major move. Let's go to the daily. It'll probably be a bit more clear there. There we go. Uh, with last year's major move. Now, the second half, or rather from May on uh, into October at least, the US dollar had almost it, what almost felt like a begrudging bullish trend. There was really good response at or around support. Uh, around highs, that response was a bit more tepid, a bit more trepidatious. And if we think back to drivers, it, it makes logical sense as to why. Because each time we would test resistance or as the dollar would get strong, this is one of those areas where President Trump would get on Twitter, put Jerome Powell back in the spotlight, back in focus. And as, as luck would have it, uh, the U.S. dollar continued to surge up to these fresh two-year highs, even through two of those FOMC rate cuts last year. It was the third cut last year when things started to calm a bit, because that's when the Fed had indicated they were ready to hold flat, at least in the near term. That's since turned into, uh, from the December dot plot matrix at least, that's since turned into the expectation for the bank to hold flat through this year, uh, at least from the Fed markets have slightly different expectations but when that begrudging bullish trend was building it did form into a rising wedge pattern with usd ticking this fresh two-year high on the very first trading day of q4 last year the october sell-off saw prices fall through the bottom of that formation and then we had a quick push up to this resistance zone that runs between 98.33 98.50 same zone that was in play back in april may Well, it came back and over a couple of different tests, it did a really good job of helping to hold the highs in the U.S. dollar. Now, there is a theme here that I'm going to link back to on another pair. But what I wanted to point out was this. If you see this one candlestick right here, and let's get a bit more granular with it. If you see that one candlestick right there, I think there's a pretty interesting note that can be had. Okay, so the swing high was set here on November 13th. We pushed down to a key support zone. Same one that came in as resistance just a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, uh, 97.70, 97.86. And then USD pushes right back into that resistance. Now, November 27th, notice the way that, that that high almost perfectly respected the swing high from two weeks prior, right? And imagine as you're watching prices climb on like a minute or a five-minute chart and you see prices approaching 
one of those high water marks. You know, what is it that you're feeling at the time? Do you feel fear of getting caught buying a high? Or do you feel that sense of FOMO where if you don't get in before the high is taken out, you're just going to miss out on more of the move? Well, I, I think that emotion set is something that can span across market participants. And it's somewhat similar to what happened here just a couple of days later, November 29th. Now, we did finally see buyers push above that swing high, but in a very fast and quick manner, sellers came back calling BS to push prices right back down and even finishing the day below the open price, thereby leading to a pin bar formation. Now, this is a pretty weak pin bar. It's a pretty weak pin bar because it doesn't quite stick out from that prior price action in October of last year. But it is a pin bar nonetheless because that, that wick sticks out, at least on the daily, like Pinocchio's nose, i.e. it's when the market is telling a lie of some kind. Now, you'll notice this here on the four-hour chart, the way this came in. Right after that quick swing high, we broke down to a fresh near-term lower low. Lower high, lower low. A downtrend then follows. We're going to get back to another one of those pin bar like formations a little bit later. Uh, I have a specific pair in mind that I wanted to focus on for that. But let's go back to our play by play so that we can get to current day. Now, we had that item of uh, let's call this capitulation that showed on November 29th. Stark sell off in the early portion of December. Quick bounce, lower high. That's when that 9770 to 9786 zone came back into play. Now, this was a key zone. November, December of 2018, March of 2019, June of 2019, even offered a bit of support in September, came right back as resistance in October, support in November. So this is a pretty well-weathered zone. Now, it's not to say that it's had so many inflections that it can't continue to inspire turns, but it is something to keep in mind upon a, a, a recursion of that zone. There might not be as much hardened resistance as there has been in the past, given how well-worn this area is. Now, on the counter side of that argument, because there have been so many inflections in that area, this is likely on a number of traders' charts. And so as we get one of those situations, or if we get one of those scenarios where prices push up, up, up into that zone, you're going to see that same emotion set come back, either fear of getting caught by in a high or the fear of missing out for not getting in before the breakout took place. And that's usually what's going to tell or show what might be around that next corner. Because if you do have that FOMO type of theme pushing and we get a fresh higher high followed by a higher low, not a lower low, but a higher low, there could be some continuation potential there. And that's something that could reopen the door for a retest of that same 98.33 to 98.50 zone. For right now, we're not quite there. Uh, what we do have is a quick test or a quick wick of support at prior resistance. Prices have bounced right back into that prior range that we had looked at on Tuesday. And now it appears as though there might be a couple of very interesting areas to try to pick off for, for, uh, for resistance. Uh, the first of which is right here. Right around 97.36, the price that came into play to hold this, la this uh, most recent four hour bar, or at least hold the high on that most recent four hour bar. Could even draw that up to recent range resistance all the way up here. Color this in as a zone. Now, granted, that is a rather large zone, but this is basically where traders can look for the dollar to top out after this morning's bump in the effort of playing short side themes or in the effort of playing prices reverting right back into that 97.05 to 97.17 zone, after which a deeper drop could come back into the uh, come back into the equation. Like I said, we're kind of playing in the cracks right now, given that there hasn't been a fresh higher, fresh low set anytime recently. We had that fresh low set on the last day of last year, but since then, it's almost as if bears have been in hibernation. So we need to let this impasse break before we can get better directional cues. So I'll usually go on next to Euro dollar, but Euro dollar is pretty unexciting now as well. Uh, next, I want to go on to the pair that I do think is a bit more exciting right now, and that's in pound dollar. I'd written about this one a little earlier this morning. Uh, I'm going to link to this one because I also touched on a couple of related markets, specifically Euro pound and pound yen. But I think this is a pretty good one as a focus chart today. And I see Cordell was asking about cable, so spot on, my friend. Um, okay, so let's 
Well, let's go ahead and work tops down. We'll do that real fast though. Okay, so last year and better part of the past few years, um, pessimism has been the name of the game in the British pound. You see here in June of 2014, when we topped out above 170. But this was a, a fairly decisive move that finally began to bottom out a few months after the Brexit referendum uh, around the quote unquote flash crash in uh, October of 2016. Now, key from that is a trend line projection that could be had from the 1985, and I believe this is technically the all time low in cable, which is saying something considering the the history of the pair. But it's that all time low that was set just below, just before the Plaza Accord 1985, that connects that same flash crash low from here in October 2016. Now, the reason that that's key is because that same theme of pessimism continued through much of last year. Same kind of story. We topped out in April of 2018. Sellers come right back. But much of 2019 price action coming into the month of August was very bearish in nature, all the way until that trend line projection began to come back into play. It was around August, September of last year. Now, September was really interesting because we had seen August, in essence, closes a doji. So you're on the monthly chart. There's August of 2019, printing that doji. That doji represented by this very messy-ish price action through that month. But early September saw a quick rush of sellers. But notice they could not take out that 119.50 low that has uh, been considered the flash crash swing low from October of 2016. Instead, saw a really strong bullish move. Notice that extended wick underneath price action, very similar to the opposite effect of what we were looking at a moment ago on a real short term basis on the US dollar. A, a pretty strong item of capitulation where sellers try to take the, the mantle, they try to swing hard, they push down to a fresh low. But that just gets the attention of buyers who come into the play and do not take a step back until fresh highs begin to show. Now, after that, through September, going into October, this began to show as a bullish theme. Higher high, higher low. In the month of October is when this thing really started to break out. We put in like an 800 plus pip run in a really short period of time, all the way until that 130 big figure could come into play. I know we looked at this one a lot last quarter. We saw about six weeks of range. And then as optimism began to show on the Brexit front, it finally broke above 130 and moved all the way up to 135, a huge move. So this was pretty chaotic as it was happening. With hindsight, it looks formulaic, but we were on these webinars this, all together at the same time. It's pretty chaotic. Since then, we basically just been looking at digestion. Now, if we look at this on a short term basis, like an hourly or four hour chart, it's going to look like there's some really clean trends in there. But in actuality, looking at this off the daily, this is digestion, a symmetrical wedge. And when that symmetrical wedge is matched up with the prior bullish theme, that makes for a bull pennant. Now, bull pennants will often be approached with a bullish bias, the expectation of which is that this was basically a corrective move after a really strong driver got priced in. In this case, it's pretty obvious what that was. It was optimism around, uh, around Brexit combined with the pricing out of pessimism around Brexit. And it looks like that wedge may soon give way. Uh, we looked at this on Tuesday. As I'd shared, there was some unfilled gap remaining at the time. That unfilled gap ran between here around uh, 3045 to 3055. As I said, a hold of resistance here kept the door open for shorts. If it started to break above, that's when we could start looking, or that's when I could start looking at the long side of the setup again. Now, I'm not quite there yet because we're still inside of the bullish or the uh, the top side trend line that makes up that symmetrical wedge formation. So we might just see prices plink right back down to that 130 level. But the door may soon be reopening for bullish continuation themes in the British pound, especially given the fact, and this happened while we were on the webinar last week, uh, that there has been an agreed upon date for the UK to leave the EU. That's the end of this month. So it appears as though the backdrop is set for some of that optimism to continue to show through. Now, what I would like to see here, or what could make this as a bit more interesting, is prices breaking above this trend line 
and finding a bit of resistance, follow through resistance off this 3117 Fibonacci level. This is a Fibonacci level that's done quite a bit of work in the recent past. You see where it cut off resistance, support, even a bit of resistance and support right in here, albeit a very messy version of it. Uh, resistance here after the breakout had started to get priced out, then a pretty good dose of support before the, the brutal part of the breakout showed up. Uh, 131.17 is simply the 38.2% retracement of that Brexit move. June 2016 high, October 2016 low, high and low of which have not yet been violated. But a bit of resistance there then reopens the door for support potential. And there's a couple of different places that I think support could remain as really attractive. A key would be holding above that 130 big figure. That same zone that I had previously looked at from the gap, the 33, or excuse me, the 3045 to 3055 area, that automatically becomes a possible level or area of higher low support. Should that 13117 level come in as breakout resistance? Now there's another level of interest, and that's 3187. Also did a pretty good job of showing resistance recently, albeit not with as much or as many inflections as that 3117 level has offered. But if we blow through 3117, and I would really only expect this if driven by some really positive headline data, but if we blow through 3117, that's an area to look to for secondary resistance, after which 3117 becomes the area to follow for higher low support in the effort of playing topside breakouts in the British pound. Uh, longer term, I think 135 could very much be possible. It's just that right now we're still in this pattern of digestion. And kind of like I was saying a little earlier, options around the US dollar appear to be very much either lining up for the bigger picture setup to align or playing in the cracks, similar to what I was looking at in the US dollar a moment ago. And also similar to what I'm going to look at in the euro right now. So when I offer those two options, I know one sounds better than the other. At least one sounds a lot better than the other to me. I'm just basically waiting for the big move to show. But big game hunting isn't always what it's cut out to be. Because sometimes you're going to go out looking for a long time without ever finding a target. And in, in this case, adopting that analogy into our current stance, our current backdrop, around FX markets, um, that would in essence be uh, like three months of range until the Fed finally starts to talk up their next move, or unless Trump brings out the idea of tax cuts or, or something along those lines, what have you. Um, but that impasse could remain for a while. I mean, there's not like an expiration date on, on when low volatility conditions have to abate. Uh, in the Euro, the pair has largely been range bound for about the past six months now. Uh, we had a pretty stark trend. It was very much doing the driving in 2018. A very valid reason as to why that trend was happening or showing. Uh, and, and that was political risk around the Eurozone. Now that general theme of pessimism continued to dominate the way the currency traded for much of last year. And I, I think it's it's real visible here on the weekly chart because you could see where there's nary a pullback. I mean, you get some of these, these, these moderate periods of retracement, but by and large, sellers have pretty much remained in control of this thing for most of the time, all the way until the dollar topped out in October of last year. Now, to set the backdrop, the ECB did, I, I, I think Draghi did one small-ish rate cut last year. The Fed completely flipped their stance. They went from four rate hikes in 2018 to three rate cuts in 2019. It, it doesn't seem like you could visualize that on this euro dollar chart, the discrepancy between those two central bank stance, central banks' stances. Now, what I think is exciting here, and something I see that Pete there we go. Uh, Pete had commented on already, Lagarde's speech was almost a New World Order type of speech for Europe. Hmm. Yeah, so I don't know about the political machinations behind that. I try to uh, avoid those topics as it uh, obscures what, in my opinion, is most important, which is price. But Christine Lagarde represents the potential for change. 
the euro for a long time was being driven by very, very loose monetary policy in the effort of staving off economic disaster. While it might have staved off economic disaster, it hasn't staved off economic contraction, which still continued to show. And there's still a plethora of economic problems throughout the European bloc. And this doesn't really seem to be up for debate even. It seems fairly well agreed upon. But what Christine Lagarde could represent is an item of change. And again, I'm not making a political statement here. I don't have a horse in the race. I live in the U.S. I hope things work out well for Europe. I really do. But selfishly, that's because it's good for us as well. What I do think is really interesting is the fact that Christine Lagarde is likely going to take a much different approach than Mario Draghi, and I'm betting the speech that Pete had linked to here. It's uh, from the ECB's own website. Unfortunately, I can't get a direct link out of the chat box, but uh, what I'm anticipating is that Christine Lagarde is going to continue to pressure some of these sovereign economies in Europe to focus a bit more on fiscal stimulus as opposed to just relying on the ECB for monetary stimulus, which seven years later has proven that it's not really bringing a lot of benefit to the European Union. Now, where that becomes interesting is the potential for a deeper bullish move in the Euro as some of that loose monetary policy gets further priced out of the picture. We've started to see maybe some slight machinations of buyers beginning to take over as indicated by a recent higher high, again, syncs up with that dollar move on the last day of last year, but a hold of higher low support, buyers coming back into the picture. So we do have a sequence of higher highs and higher lows that have continued to show here over the past couple of months. And, you know, and again, if we look at the recent history behind the Euro, that's, that's the exception and not the rule. Um, let's get a little tighter. There we go, four hour chart. Okay, so we had looked at this setup last week and I was basically, again, just trying to play between the cracks. Uh, was looking for support off 1082, resistance off 1145. That setup cleared fairly quickly around NFP, NFP last Friday, uh, shortly after at least, this is when this thing had finally topped out. Quick pullback, another higher low, quick test up to a higher high. Look at all of those wicks, maybe even a bit of capitulation here with that wick that just sticks out from that prior batch of resistance points. But a hold above that swing low at 11.18 keeps the door open for bullish strategies, short-term bullish strategies. But looking for prices to move back towards that longer-term zone of resistance that runs between 11.87 and 112.12. Let's get down a little bit tighter hourly chart. There we go. You can see where the past couple of hours have seen buyers trying to step in after that pullback. And that pullback appears to be very related to the USD spike on the back of this morning's data. So something that I wouldn't necessarily uh, look at as a game changer yet. Now, bigger picture, and I think one of the, the primary issues with bullish plays in the euro right now is this big zone of resistance is setting ahead like a roadblock, that 1187 to 1212 confluent zone that's been in play in one form or another for much of the time since November of 2018. So for near-term setups, I'm basically going to need to factor profit targets inside of that area. So 1145 becomes the next objective with a hold of support. After which, looking for a move up to around 11.62, this just very general area of resistance that had popped in earlier this morning, also yesterday. After that, 11.87 comes into play. And for those that do want to look for the topside breakout, this is one of those scenarios where maybe a break even stop while keeping the last scale open to see if some topside push does develop could keep that door open. I think the big story in the Euro is going to happen later this year as Christine Lagarde further makes her mark on the ECB. She doesn't seem to be very bashful or, or stuck to tradition. Um, it really does seem as though she's going to take a political bent into the equation. And again, I'm not taking a stance on whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. As a trader, that presents change. Change presents volatility. Volatility presents opportunity. And that's what I think is, is most incredibly interesting around the scenario uh, around Euro right now. Okay, Aussie dollar. Now, I had said a little earlier, I was going to bring another one of those potential items of capitulation back into the mix. And there might be something workable here in Aussie dollar. And this becomes one of the more interesting setups, in my humble opinion, to play for USD strength. 
if we are going to see the dollar uh, uh, rally up to that 97.70 level, I think this is an area that could remain pretty attractive in the near term. So Aussie was mired in a longer term downtrend, uh, really retraced aggressively towards the latter portion of last year. It really looks as though there was some very heavy short cover from that elongated downside move going into year end. And then noticeably right here, first trading day of 2020, starts to top. Now, initially, it just looked like a pullback. I'd even looked at it as such. I think it was uh, not this Monday, but the Monday before. Prices have pulled back to this prior zone of resistance around 69.30. It even held above this, this, this shorter term bullish trend line. And then what happened after that? RBA talks about the prospect of a rate cut. Now there's some rate divergence to work with, right? Because the, the Fed's saying, oh, we're going to hold flat in the near term. RBA saying, oh, we might actually cut. And so that's where you could see that getting priced in. It was quick. It was fast. Uh, but like we looked at last week, all of these wicks setting on the underside of price action, it really did not look as though sellers were going to be ready to push until at least a bit of a pullback. Now, we started to look at this zone 6930, that same zone of prior support, for lower high resistance potential. And that started to show, we looked at it on Tuesday, uh, it started to show last week, but it held coming into this week. Now there was a quick spurt of strength after which that 69.30 level was actually crossed, albeit temporarily. And then sellers came back with aggression, thereby leading to that potential item cap of capitulation that could be seen on the on the daily chart. All right, you see where there's this wick cover right in here over that, over that three day period? Right, where buyers just cannot cannot take that that resistance out. And then we get that test above, but it was almost like it was a, hey sellers, there's your resistance. Are you gonna act? Well, it looks like they're starting to act now. And uh, this keeps the door open for short side sets, looking for prices to revert back towards recent range support around 68 and a half, after which it moved towards 68, could become attractive. Underneath there is a veritable landmine because it's pretty messy from 68 down to 67. 67 specifically is going to be a tough level for sellers just because of the number of tests that have already faltered there. I do expect at some point in a long USD backdrop that that level will give away at some point, but it might not even be this year if the dollar continues to face pressure in the way that it has since Q4 of last year. But could be a possible little reversal formation working on the daily here. It could be incorporated or worked with. All right, for next week, dollar CAD. This is going to be a big focus pair uh, as we have uh, Canadian inflation. I think that's 8.30 Wednesday morning. And then at 10 Wednesday morning, we get the Bank of Canada. Now, as I looked at this one on Tuesday, I'm still pretty just overall bearish in the pair. And there's a couple of different reasons for it. Let's work our way down. Uh, so there was a symmetrical wedge that had formed and built and held throughout pretty much most of last year. Didn't start to give way until the final week of 2020. There's December 27th. We put in that downside break. A few days later, we finally saw prices perch below that 130 psychological level. But even as I looked at shortly after coming back for the new year, this didn't really seem ready to continue lower yet. Since then, uh, we've basically seen a bit of correction. That quick higher high at 30.25 is going to become of note, higher low. And then prices ran right into 131. We looked at this last week ahead of, uh, well, on Tuesday and then on Thursday ahead of NFP. NFP was pretty interesting, and not necessarily because of NFP. NFP disappointed, but Canadian jobs came out really strong. And so this is like a one-two effect of dollar weakness, CAD strength, and you can see where sellers are getting right back in the driver's seat, but they weren't able to drive for long. They were rebuffed right at 130.25, that same swing high that had come into play just a few days earlier. Since then, that has helped to set support. The challenge on dollar CAD is that while the short side of this looks really attractive to me, I don't know how much juice is in that squeeze at the moment, because even if we were able to budge through 130.25, are we actually going to be able to leave 130 behind this time? I'm not the only one that saw what happened two weeks ago when this thing got caught sub 130. Sellers dried up. Buyers ended up taking over. 
evoking a bullish trend that ran for about 150 pips, peak to trough. I don't like those odds. So I got to look at trading this move inside. Inside is in using recent inside price action, like a level like 130.80, where these swing highs had come into play earlier this week. Or perhaps even repurposing that same 131 level that was in use last week. Or potentially 131.32 to 131.50. I think this could be a really attractive zone because now not only do we have intersection with the support side of that symmetrical wedge, that longer term symmetrical wedge, but this would also have the luxury of taking out all of the trailed stops that are likely setting above that very obvious swing high at around 131.05. It's a nice little area to look for potential capitulation. The short side of the move, and I think this is what's going to remain as, as pretty unattractive in the near term, is just that proximity to the big figure. We looked at this theme quite a bit last year because there was two different occasions where sellers had what felt like every opportunity in the world to take out 130. They just failed both times. One time we came about 15 pips from the low. The other, it was like 40-ish pips from the low. So... I'm still trepidatious about looking to chase this thing so low. Uh, give me one second. All right. All right, so off the daily chart, there is another level that I wanted to bring attention to, and that's right here at 130.65. There's a Fibonacci level of note here, and this is something that could could modify or alter that approach depending on the way that prices trade with that level upon a retest. So if we take this swing high from January of 2016, draw that down to the swing low in September of 2017. Notice that right there at 130.65 is the 38.2 of that major move. Now, I, the reason that I think this could be of note is if we look on the daily chart, notice where there has been five consecutive days of resistance at that price with a general sense of lower highs coming into play throughout. So what could make this a bit more interesting ahead of a 130.80 print is prices coming back to 130.65 and then finding resistance inside of those prior swing highs. Now, something like that could work for me because I could then look at stops above that prior swing high and then I could factor that down to a retest of 130.25, then 130, stop the break even, play breakout on the remainder of the lot and then see if I could get that breakdown type of theme or scenario. That's what I'm looking at, dollar CAD. Okay, dollar yen. All right, went a little longer than expected, so I'm going to go a little bit faster here. Uh, dollar yen, it's, it's still pushing. It's above 110. Um, now, as I mentioned, I was going to look at a few of these potential items of capitulation. This one doesn't yet have it. But this is something to watch for the next couple of days or specifically today to see if buyers are going to be able to sustain that move. If they are able to sustain the move above 110, there could possibly be an open door for bullish continuation up to around 110.75 to 110.86. There's another big zone up here that hasn't been tested in a long time since like May of last year. So far, buyers have held the line. They haven't yet taken out that swing high uh, from from Friday of last week. So I'm still rather indecisive, but the key is going to be holding this above 110. And again, think back to your own mentality when these types of things are happening, right? Dollar yen just broke above 110 for only the second time in the past six months. Are you afraid of getting caught buying a top? Or is that fear more of missing out? on the breakout if and when it does take place. Now, my focus on the matter is, is one that circles back to the US dollar. I'm not of the mind the US dollar is in the midst of an elongated bullish run yet or at this point. So uh, that FOMO factor wouldn't be much of an issue for me today. Uh, if I do want to trade for yen weakness, I think there's a few other more attractive places to do it. Uh, case in point, one of the markets that I wrote about earlier this morning in pound yen, uh, this one is becoming more and more exciting. Uh, especially given that we're seeing the British pound come back to life with uh, a Brexit date actually set that looks like it might hold. So there's a Fibonacci level that was previously hoping to hold the highs earlier this morning. I pointed it out in the article that I shared a little bit earlier. And that uh, resistance level 
real simple to find. It's 38.2% Fibonacci retracement of this major move. 2016 flash crash, flash crash and cable low up to the January 2018 swing high. Now, 143.78 level, this isn't the first time we've looked at it. Did a great job of helping to set support March, April of last year, just before that Brexit pessimism factor really started to drive matters. But it's recently come back into play as resistance. Now, that early, early year sell-off, buyers came in, set support above that 140.75 level. Since then, it's been a continuation of higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. Now with a fresh higher high. Now 145 is likely going to be somewhat of a somewhat of an obstacle. And generally speaking, chasing fresh breakouts doesn't usually work out that well. But on a short-term basis, there is something to follow here. And that's taking that longer-term Fibonacci level that again has a bit of history behind it, recently showed as resistance, and then looking for higher low, short-term higher low support to hold at which point the door could reopen for short-term bullish strategies, looking for that bullish theme to extend. And as noted earlier, that 145 level becomes a very obvious area of potential resistance, i.e. profit target potential. So if I'm looking for yin weakness, I think this could be a more exciting venue to work with at the moment. Uh, yin strength as well. There could be better venues for that. Uh, like Euro yen, for instance, is currently testing the top side of a wedge formation. Now, I wanted to keep this one on here. Uh, this was from last year. It was one that we had looked at Q3 uh, of a falling wedge that basically helped to mark uh, a, a, an entire trend change or entire trend flip. Those falling wedges will usually be approached with bullish reversals, and that's what ended up following or, or showing through. Um, the support side of that wedge formation, or the more recent wedge formation, was in play just last week. As that risk on mode has come back into markets, prices have jumped up to a fresh 2020 high, but currently sellers are showing up, and it just so happens that it's right around that trend line projection. A bit higher, around 123.10 is the level of Fibonacci resistance. That's a bit of context for potential risk placement. But what got my attention earlier today, and the reason I wanted to look at this one this afternoon, is because after that quick swing high was set, i.e., even with a bit of potential capitulation showing there, the sellers have started to tiptoe back into the water with a lower low. Again, a short-term lower low, but when we're playing between the cracks, those little deductive signals can be really, really helpful, especially when trying to find swing trades. So at this point, the objective is to follow and ensure that that swing high remains respected. If it does, the door can remain open for short side sets. Uh, looking for reversal scenarios to come back after what's become a really strong week in Euro Yen. More than 200 pips gained from the low just last week. Okay, I said I would also look at gold and oil, so we will. And then I'll begin taking some questions. All right, this just kind of exacerbates the I don't want to say the boredom, but the, the lack of volatility type of argument that we've uh, that we've been smited with of recent. But I'll say this for gold. It's worked fairly well with levels so far. Um, 1535 is a support level that I've been following. It's just taken off of the September swing high, the late September swing high. No major neuroscience required in finding that level. But it did a great job of helping to hold the low last Friday. And it was around that NFP print last Friday when the dollar started to sell off again that we started to see that bounce take place in gold. That bounce ran into this week, and prices moved all the way up until they found resistance at another familiar level of 1557.10. This is the 2019 swing high. That level has since held through a couple of different approaches. And now if we look on a shorter-term basis, you can see where it looks as though sellers are beginning to drive a bit more. Near term, a lower low, a bit of support coming in off this Fibonacci level. This is something that might bring that 1535 level back into play relatively soon. So I think that that longer term, bigger picture bullish trend in gold, I think it's going to have to continue to take a back seat for now. As once again, that move got a little bit ahead of itself. Now we got to digest those, those, those breakout gains. 
until buyers are able and ready to take back over the scenario. Oil. Okay, this is what we'll look at to close off this week's setups. So as I was looking at this on Thursday, or excuse me, on Tuesday, I started to follow or look for support. Now, what I was using for that was a simple trend line. Simple trend line taken from the swing low October, November of last year. Projection of which it started to come back into play on Tuesday, technically Monday and then Tuesday. What ultimately has helped to call the low is this Fibonacci level. It's 38.2% retracement of the 2019 recovery move. I mean, it caught it to a pip. I mean, it was a beautiful move or beautiful catch at least. What's happened since, however? Quick test up to a higher high, quick higher low, another push up to a higher high. Now we're testing resistance at prior support. I mean, that's exactly where we're at right now. So for those that really want to go for the jugular on a short side move in oil, hold of resistance at the current area could very much keep that door open. Look at this on the four hour chart. You can see where that last four hour bar tested just above it temporarily and then came right back below. A hold of that high could keep the door open for short side swings, targeting that same 57.37 low. Uh, likely traders are going to want to have an inside profit target around 57.80. Secondaries could be plotted at 57.37, stop the break even, and then look for the bigger picture breakdown towards that 55 area. On the long side of this, a bit of confirmation is going to is still going to be needed. Uh, I think on the long side of this, traders are going to want to see prices close above on this on the four hour close above that same resistance level, right? The same resistance level that cut off that candlestick body on the most recent four hour candle. So like if we get a bullish candle close for the current four hour candle, that's at least like acknowledgement that resistance level was traded through by buyers in a follow through move. And that could reopen the door for another push up towards 59.64 slash 60, that resistance zone. Uh, and that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. Uh, Mr. Vinny Palma, good to see you. And thank you, sir. Hello, James, and a belated Happy New Year to you. Uh, any thoughts on Aussie post-phase one and its reaction today? Seems like no relief and could lead to a break in Euro Aussie beyond range. Looking for upside through 165 midterm. All the best, Vinny. An absolute class act. Thank you, sir. Um, it just did full transparency. I have zero kind of expectations around Aussie after the phase one deal that was signed yesterday. You know, I've personally been a little bit, I don't want to say like standoffish, but nor do I want to say uh, cynical, but, you know, the the bigger factor at play for me in Aussie is, is, is just continued to be rate differential, rate divergence, uh, central bank stances. I didn't get extremely excited about the the overlay from from U.S. China trade war in in that vehicle last year. Um, you know, and, and given the moves we've seen this year, right? Seeing the way that Aussie has traded, had that big break above the 70 big fig. I mean, that really seemed like it was a dollar move. I mean, like just a straight USD move as the dollar was dumping down to five month lows. Aussies jumping up to five month highs that those two sink. And I mean, there wasn't any, any greater optimism here around us, China than there was here a couple of weeks earlier in December and the potential for some, some, some bullish continuation was holding in that very first week of the year, but it completely dissipated once the RBA started talking about rate cuts. And so that's one of the reasons that my focal point on this one has been, you know, very standardized rate differential between the two representative central banks. Uh, Euro Aussie, let me take a quick look. I do like what you're thinking, though, um, because, you know, from a fundamental basis, it seems like Australia has a lot more room to go lower or has some room to go lower. I mean, I'm not just talking about rates because they're going to they're going to hit the lower floor here soon. But, you know, I've even heard grumblings of potential QE out of Australia. And that's something they haven't really even dabbled with yet. Whereas Europe's I mean, they're in the full throes of that thing. Um, 
technical basis, we're battling some resistance. You know, we're at the 50 marker of this longer term major move, uh, 2008 high, 2012 low, that 50 marker. I mean, this has basically been, you know, kind of the band that would not break so far. Now, with that said, nothing lasts forever, right? The big question is whether or not I could get deductive signals that, 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 uh, bearish responses are waning bullish responses are increasing and, and i can't quite see that it's still pretty messy off this weekly go down to the daily kind of the same it looks like more of a range to me at least at this point so if i wanted to gear this thing up for top side yeah i would basically need to focus us focus on this in a really short-term manner like focusing in on this move this priced in since the end of the year and there's some decent techs at play with this. But like we had a hold of the 50 from that major move, resists the 23.6. You know, maybe focusing in on that 38.261 and a quarter for higher low support. Alternatively, letting prices take out that 62 figure to, to prove the buyers are going to be able to continue to drive, after which uh, pullback potential to around 61.90. Could become attractive uh so yeah I, I think there's definitely some stuff to work with here um a longer term basis we're looking for that 65 print the big factor of consideration that i would have is just how much resistance is built in here off of that 50 fib that uh, halfway marker of the big picture major move in the pair uh but like i said fundamental basis i'm all about it because Europe appears to be in the midst of or, or at the forefront of some change whereas australia appears to be going as though they might go down the path that uh, so many of these developed central banks have went over or through over the past eight, 10 years. Mr. Cordell Nunez, hey James, hope all is well, you're in. Can you please take a look at dollar yen on the monthly prices right up against resistance trend line at approximately uh, 110, 110.20. You can see that from the past two days, this is clearly resistance area. What are your thoughts on where it would go from here? Surely if the signing of the trade deal yesterday was uh, viewed as extremely positive, we'd have seen a bullish reaction to dollar yen. It's not even made a new high this week. Cheers. I love what you're doing and parsing through those drivers and then looking at the deductive side of it and then taking, I mean, and, and I mean this in the most loving of manners and taking a kind of a cynical view of it. I think that's something that's really, really helpful for traders, just overall critical thinking and trying to poke holes in these theorems that, you know, are often kind of so widely accepted by financial media that it almost seems though they're real when they're not, you know, kind of like, oh, stocks are going to get split in half if Trump wins. OK, well, how'd that work out? Or, oh, the UK economy is going to completely die off into the Atlantic if uh, Brexit happens. OK, well, how did that happen? Um, you know, it didn't work out so well for those prognosticators, but coincidentally, they don't have to talk about it anymore because they're just on to the next panic or, or criteria. Um, let me see what I could dig in here. So this is, the devil is the detail. Uh, devil is in the detail with these trend lines, right? So I'm going to draw this technically correct and encapsulate all of these highs. It's really just a two-point touch. If I want to get this down to a three-point touch, you know, so now I'm getting a touch there, a bit of recognition there. So I could kind of see where that moving line of resistance was. Now it's just above. If I want to get this, what I call max touches, probably going to be better right there, max touches. We've already broken through it after resistance hold last week. So trend lines, especially on a long-term basis, can be real tough to work with if, if there is a lot of noise around those levels. Uh, if I'm going to draw this to that max touches type of area, then, yeah, you're exactly, you know, I think you're kind of looking in the right direction as, you know, this thing's had every excuse and reason in the world to break out. It broke out in anticipation of the signing of the phase one trade deal. You've got a little bit of run, but when the deal was actually signed, it went nowhere. And that's something that could keep the door open for deductive uh, fades or, or for uh, reversal types of scenarios. On a pure technical basis, I don't have much of a read on it, unfortunately. I wish I had a, a better feel for it. But, you know, if we didn't have that support hold, you know, 109.80, then I'd be able to get uh, a lot busier with it. But for now, I just got to wait and see you know, which direction the wind's going to blow.
Yeah, and so this one, um, could you take a look at cable daily prices right up against the underside of a resistance trend line and actually bounced off support trend line uh, on the daily after the CPI data release? Sellers didn't seem ready to take it lower. Thoughts would be appreciated. Cheers. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I, they came in a little earlier, so hopefully I, I, had, uh, I was looking at the same one as yourself. Um, but yeah, we're timing deeper and deeper into this longer term. I call it longer term, just drawing it off the daily, but uh, drawn deeper and deeper into this bull pennant formation. Uh, my guess would be bullish resolution, but at this point, you know, we're at the stage in the game where neither, neither buyers nor sellers have showed their hands. So we just got to kind of read the tea leaves and uh, try to play off innuendo. I, I, I think one conditional way, and this is kind of the um, the anti-confrontational way of going about it, is to let it break and then look to play the pullback after that. At the very least, I could manage the risk on that pullback after getting a cue as to which direction this thing might roll. Um, but my guess would be higher, given the motive that had propelled price in this area in the first place. Yep, agree with Gary. Cable's running out of real estate. It's running out of real estate. And uh, Pete with a good note here. Very positive retail sales pending over the uh, uh, pending from the overnight on sterling. Uh, interest rates have increased in uh, GBP too. I think expectations uh, around rate hikes are going to continue going in that direction. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Long Island dollar cad seems like typical breakout fake out behavior seen in many or most pairs. Mean reversion and return to the range seems to be more common than breakouts. Oh yeah, I mean that's 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 yeah, that happens. Um, so there's, it's not even an old shorthand, but it's, you know, it's kind of one of these cliches where breakout traders are going to have probably the lowest winning percentages. Because most of the time, like if we have to bet on something new happening or the same old, same old, the status quo, I mean, most of the time it's going to be status quo. And so I think that's why one of the reasons uh, that so many of us at Daily Effects will mostly be trying to fade these moves when they happen. Because if there's one paradigm that often seems attractive, it's fading hope, right? And what is a fresh breakout? Fresh breakout is hope. Hope don't pay the bills. That hope, if it's going to become a bullish trend, it needs some confirmation. So most of the time, when I see prices breaking out to a fresh high, finding resistance, I'm looking for a way to fade it. But yeah, the uh, what you're speaking of here, I think, is, is, is kind of a philosophical, I don't want to call it a conundrum, but kind of a philosophical dilemma that many traders will eventually face at one point in time. Uh, do you want to be the person that's chasing hope or do you want to be the person calling bs when that hope arises and i think it just as a generality most experienced most longer term traders will be in the latter of those camps where they're much happier to sit on the sidelines and call bs and then then try to take small losses when they're wrong but yeah, to that point, breakout traders will usually have a much lower winning percentage, which is why they have to concentrate on their risk so much because they have to keep those mini losses very light or else they're not going to be able to offset them when they do get one of those breakouts that eventually takes place. Dollar Cat in particular has a tendency to be rangy. And one of the big reasons for that is because the the strong relationship between the U.S. and Canada. You know, sure, deviations will take place, trends will exist, they'll show up from time to time, but by and large, the kind of the general modus operandi around a pair like dollar cat is rangy in nature, similar with euro pound, just because there's so much cross-border trade. If something good happens for Europe, it's also somewhat good for the UK, or at least until January 31st <laughs> was kind of the accepted case. Um, but similar for dollar cat, I mean, if something great happens for the US, Canada's going to benefit, and vice versa. Very rarely will it be, you know, all great for Canada and all bad for the U.S. Another manner of approach from Pete. I like playing dollar cab both ways for now. The break is eluding the pair. It definitely has. It definitely has, but that potential, it is still there. 
it is still there. You know, but in essence, I'm going to use inside price action to try to trade short-term bearish trends. And if that breakout happens, great. And if it doesn't, that's cool too. <laughs> Pete with the uh, the timing algorithm, greenback buyers back from lunch in NYC. Yeah, it was kind of quiet out there today too. Even though we have some unseasonably pleasant weather. Knock on wood. Uh, Mr. Gary Diebel, uh, dollar yen. Jeremy Wagner has uh, one ten seventy one seventy eight six Fibo. Possible retrace from the last resort. Yeah, Jeremy's levels are really strong. Um, you know, he's got a bunch of different ways that he comes to levels, but uh, his, his levels are really strong. I, I could see something like that. I mean, although, in all honesty, if dollar yen breaks out to one ten eighty, pulls back, finds support, I'm likely looking to get long. At that point, I hope that I'm right, <laughs> but uh, but I still don't know. Don't know until it's too late. Sean Lloyd, not sure if you have seen some of the particular details of the newly signed phase one trade deal, but do you think this deal was more of a buy the rumor, sell the news event? Yeah, I mean, it seems like the general kind of consensus was, was a bit of disappointment, but it's something. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I'm not the, the guy that's going to parse through the D, uh, through the you know, the, the details of that deal and say, well, this has got to happen and that's got to happen. No, I think the, the simple signatory element of it is what's most positive is that both the U S and China, they don't want to create global economic calamity. We finally saw a bit of negotiation, a bit of give, maybe not to the degree that everybody was hoping or expecting, but it's a phase one, which means there's going to be a phase two. So hope reigns eternal. I know one of the big factors that caught a lot of folks by surprise is the fact that tariffs are going to remain in place until after the election. And so I know that brought a lot of disappointment into the mix. But, you know, looking at stocks, they're still doing pretty well. All factors considered, right? Just continue to break away and run. So who am I to uh, <laughs> to fight the tides? Uh, for Pete, RBA did state that they're looking at a cut this year. I know. They didn't even want to leave it to any window. They just came right out and said it. Um, for, also, for Pete, the Australian fires are truly awful, and they have a fairly significant impact on it. Oh, man, it's so bad. It's so bad. I've seen a lot of the pictures on uh, social media, and that's – it's really sad. Really sad. <laughs> with Gary Deeble, uh James, you see Euro Swiss is the five-year anniversary yesterday. What's funny, and I even said this to my wife uh, yesterday morning before I left the house. It's like, hey, happy 115 day. She's like, what do you mean? But the first thing I think of January 15th every year is that. So, yeah, I think it's a bitter twist of irony. <laughs> the Swiss franc has continued to strengthen after pushing down to a fresh near-term low yesterday. Um, as Switzerland's getting called out as a currency manipulator, I mean, there's just too much irony wrapped up around this whole situation. Uh, Stephen Long Island, dog cat has been in the same range since the beginning of 2016, just looking at higher time frames. Yeah, I mean, I had it as a symmetrical wedge because that range has been tightening, 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 tightening. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I got it from May of 2017, September 2017, where it's just getting more and more narrow. Um... So yeah, I'm 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 pretty much right there with you. I think what makes this, uh, or what's what's made this a lot more exciting of recent is the prospect of a symmetrical wedge break and getting one of those elongated moves or trends in one direction if one of these things can pass through or if one of these things can come through. Now, what my anticipation was was the motive here, the motive driver was going to be FOMC getting looser and looser and looser and looser. Uh, we just haven't heard that yet. That driver is still kind of waiting there recognition. Oh, Sean Lloyd, my pleasure. 100 right back to you, my friend. Always, always a pleasure to help. Uh, Cordell, cheers, Dan uh, cheers, James. Thanks so much for the top analysis. Answer my questions. All the best. You are an absolute gentleman, my friend. All right. I got to take out, I got to take the last question of the day. And uh, given the anniversary, it seems like this one is very apropos. <laughs> it's a new word for me. It's not, but it's not a word that I use very often and uh, started to um, from Pete 
Uh, I have colleagues that were literally washed out by the business, uh, washed out of the business from SMB on 115.15. They're permanently trigger shy. Sad. It is. It is a really bad scenario. And I mean, I, I just know for myself, before that all happened, I would watch on TV and see like when Bear Stearns went up, when Lehman went up. And I remember watching the watching the folks walk out of Lehman with, you know, with the banker's boxes full of, you know, all their belongings. And, it, it, you know, I felt a bit of pity at the time. I mean, I was still in the business, but, you know, it, it was hard for me to really picture what it was like to be in that scenario, how utterly terrifying it is to, you know, to have to look at, you know, the business news to figure out what your future might hold. It was, a, I mean, it was, it was unlike anything I've, I've been through before or since and something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Um, for your friends though, what I will say is, and again, I don't know them personally, I'm not gonna be an armchair psychologist here, but you know, if they wanna stay in the game, they can. They just have to start anew. You know, that chapter didn't work well, it didn't have a good ending, but the book isn't over yet. And, uh, you know, I wasn't wiped out by the event Myself, uh, I wasn't even really looking at Swiss weakness at all around the time, but, you know, I know a lot of folks that were, you know, they just didn't come back, you know, it was such a calamitous event that, you know, they kind of let that, they kind of let that rule their lives thereafter. And here we are five years later and, you know, they basically had a major life change over something that they had zero control over. So it stinks, but it's, likely very similar to the blowups that probably every trader in this room has experienced at one point in time. It's a test of who you are and who you want to be. And this could be a really brutal, difficult business to be in. But it's those scars that harden us and make us better at continuing in it. So for what it's worth, and I, I don't know if this is something you want to share with them, Pete, but um, you know, most great traders have been through at least one of those types of scenarios where if they weren't blown up because of some central bank action, it was for some other reason. But they allowed that scarring to harden them to the point where they were a little bit more emotionally calloused to where they weren't as affected by small little losses. And they exerted a ton of control or tried to exert a ton of control over their approach moving forward because they knew that that was all that they had. It was in their control. Because those things are going to happen. You're going to see central banks make unexpected announcements all the time. That one just really didn't work out for them at all. But there is hope for a new day. It's all about whether or not they want to fight. And if they don't, then, you know, that's cool too. Everybody's got one life to live. They get to make their own choices. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back next week, Tuesday and Thursday. Love to see you back in the room if you have the time. But uh, thank you for that time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.